deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. The tone of too much in the church these days is skip one and two and just follow Jesus. But I've got in my hand here light and leaven, the challenge of the laity in the 21st century. And in this book, Bishop Strickland writes, the darkness that we face is deep. It has been building for centuries, permitted by God for whatever reasons. It seems like we're reaching a crescendo of evil. But remember the old ditty, better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. I think we need to be candle lighters. We need to be torch lighters, bonfire lighters, for the light of Christ in this darkness. I think we have to acknowledge the darkness and acknowledge that Satan and evil are powerful, but Christ has overcome them. We do live in difficult days, dark days, although I would say there's a lot of people today that would deny that. They would say, it's not that bad. You're just, you know, hyping, you're, you're spinning things, you're fanning the flame, you're just making things more divisive. What would you say to that, uh, Your Excellency, Bishop Strickland? Well, as I, in that quote from the book, um, I think we need to, to wake up. We need to not panic. As I said, Christ has conquered all the evil that we're seeing, all the lies and the foolishness and the uh, apparently uh, calculated uh, false messages that seem to be coming from church and state. But to be aware is to be forewarned, you might say, to, uh, to be ready to, to stand for the truth. Um, I think it's important that we don't give in to anger. Certainly, when a fire is overtaking your neighborhood, you can't just say, oh, everything's fine. We don't want to uh, be, become alarmed. Certainly, uh, I'm accused sometimes, I suppose, of being an alarmist. But as we look at the world and really as men of faith, I think both of us see that many have turned from God. And even within the church, it's like, who's in charge? Is it the ancient um, truth proclaimed by Christ? And we were celebrating today, St. Lawrence, the deacon and martyr from, I believe, the third century, very early in the church with a lot of persecution. What did they die for? They died for the truth that Christ died for. Those of us who truly want to live an apostolic faith have to be ready to die. That doesn't mean that we're going out seeking for someone to martyr us, but we stand for the truth. Joyfully, clearly, um, and vigorously, we stand for the truth. We've talked a lot about World Youth Day, and I've pointed out a lot of things that I've been highly critical of. And shouldn't we be calling these things out in spite of the fact that there are some good things? Shouldn't we still be calling these things out? Don't they need to be called out? Absolutely, Joe. And uh, I believe, I mean, uh, we're two Joes that a lot of people would argue with. But I think the mixed messages troubled me uh, the most. There were priests there that were speaking that are known for challenging the, the scripture and tradition truth that the, the church has proclaimed for many, many centuries. And I think that what I would say is most troubling to me is the mixed messaging. All are welcome, but you don't hear a lot about or much of anything about what does Christ say? Yes, absolutely, he welcomes everyone, we believe. He came as Lord of all, and that one day all of us will kneel at his name. That, that's his mission. We're a long way from that in the world today. But in the mystery of God's plan, we believe that all are called to follow Jesus Christ. But that following is preceded by some real challenges that the, word himself, the Lord himself spoke of. Deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And the tone of too much in the church these days is skip one and two and just follow Jesus. If you're really following him, even if you decide to, to skip one and two, if you truly follow him, you're gonna find one and two because that's what he did. He models for us what he calls us to do. And that I think is the challenge for us as disciples. And I didn't see that happening. 
uh, the way it should happen in this, as you said, many positive things. And I know I, bishops that went with the, the very best intentions and determined to proclaim the truth of Christ and to evangelize and to bring people closer to the sacred heart of Christ. But when it's a mixed message, that causes people to say they're not sure. Instead of being a resounding clarion call for the youth of the world to know Jesus Christ, it was muddled, it was mixed, and that is harmful. The more the, the message is less than clear and less than joyful and vibrant, the more people say, eh, I don't, I don't, get, I don't buy that, I, I don't see anything great value there. We're just celebrating during August some wonderful saints with St. John Vianney, um, St. Teresa Benedicta yesterday, St. Lawrence today, Sixtus II, one of the earliest popes to die, mentioned in the, the canon of the, the Mass, the first Eucharistic prayer. Those are great models, and they were not ambiguous. They said, Christ alone, and if I have to die for his name, so be it. In your book, you also say, we owe God worship. That's a basic revelation to the people of Israel. The Holy Mass is the liturgy of liturgies, the most perfect way to fulfill the, this duty here on earth. Look to the Old Testament. The description of, of the tabernacle there, it takes pages to describe the gold and the cedar and all the adornments and everything so precise, the measurements. That's the kind of care we need to bring to welcoming the Lord of the universe at our masses, at any gathering where Catholics come together to proclaim Jesus Christ. I'll never forget the first time I met you. Uh, you had it had just been announced that you were going to be the the bishop of Tyler, Texas. Clearly, like the reality of your office has truly set in. And in this book, you really touch on that. You talk about how there's a mixed bag among amongst bishops. Some are, are, are outspoken. Some are fence sitters. I would say most are fence sitters, too afraid to, to rock the boat in any way, shape, or form. And some have an agenda that they push that is not good for Holy Mother Church, let alone the world around us. What has been your reality in that process? How have you moved from that first day of oh my heavens, I'm going to be a bishop to where you are today. Well, it has been um, almost 11 years, and it's been quite a journey. Um, it's hard to believe that's when we, we first met, and I appreciate your work, Joe. It really has been a, I guess I would say, a, a continuing awakening to the darkness we face and the wonder of the light. And thankfully, it's been a... a, a real balance back and forth in my own heart and my own life. The tremendous responsibility of being a successor of the apostles has really just knocked me over, but also the joy of the gospel, the good news. Thankfully, I haven't just been made aware of the darkness and the evil that is palpable in our time in the church and in the world. I've also been made more deeply aware through the rosary, through Eucharistic adoration, through the prayers of many for me, um, especially in recent weeks. Um, but I've been made aware of the wonder and goodness of the Lord. It, it is knowing him, living in Christ is the pearl of great price. It's everything he speaks about in the gospel, all those images of the kingdom. He is the kingdom. He is truth incarnate. And what we have to realize is he leads us to a fullness that we can't even fathom or imagine in this life. That's why it's such a poverty to water it down, to shortchange it, to say, oh, let's shape the gospel message in our image. No, it's in the image of God because we're called, as Pope Benedict has said, we're called to greatness. We're not called to just be comfortable. And there's much desire for comfort in our world. I've come to realize that part of my blessing and part of my curse, at least in terms of the world, it's by far a blessing. But it, it is a cross in some ways. But I'm much more a first century Christian in the 21st century 
than I am going along with the 21st century tone of things. And I, I think we have to all look at the first century Christians because what I'm hearing proclaimed even from the, the top of the church, from the hierarchy, by too many is a, a sort of a, a mediocre, sort of uh, watered down, diminished gospel that isn't attractive. I hate to tell them, but it's not attractive. If we stay on this path, who's going to, who's interested? The church isn't just a club that you, you do certain things. If it's not about body and soul devotion to Jesus Christ and a willingness to have your blood poured out as he did, then what's the attraction? It doesn't answer people's problems. It doesn't bring them the joy that should come from knowing Jesus Christ. And so I can't do anything but speak out. I've often wondered, and I just recently had a conversation about where is the line? Obviously, a long time ago, I mean, not when you spoke to me that first time, I didn't know what was coming. But along the way, a line got crossed where it said, okay, Joe Strickland in Tyler, Texas, that nobody's ever heard of me or the place, many people, I had to speak up. And people said, "What's who's that guy? What's he saying? Why is he talking? And I've kept talking, sadly, <laughs> for some. But uh, I can't do anything else. I can't not proclaim Christ because I know him, not as deeply as I would, I'm called to and as I want to, but I know him well enough that I will not quit proclaiming his glorious message, the joy of his gospel. It's all good news if we follow Jesus Christ. And that's the mystery of like St. Teresa Benedicta of the cross. Here's this woman. If you want to know a story about faith, read her story. She began as Edith Stein and became Sister Benedicta of the cross. And that of the cross phrase is key to her conversion. We try to avoid the cross. The joy of following Christ is through the cross. He tries to tell us that. He models it for us. But as human beings, really throughout the history of the church, there's always a human tendency to say, well, I don't want the suffering part. I just want the glory and the joy. But Jesus shows us you've got to go through the suffering to the joy. As Archbishop Sheen used to say, you can't have Easter Sunday without Good Friday. So what do you say to the lay folk? What should we do? Well, absolutely pray. And that sounds like almost a cliche these days. But if we think about what prayer really is, uh, another maybe deeper way to say it, connect to God, to ne- connect to the Lord of truth. But beyond prayer, because people are always say, well, what do I do besides pray? Hold fast to the truth. And that means even in your own workplace, even in your own family, not to get violent or judgmental toward others, but if someone comes to your family home and speaks things that are not the truth, you have to tell them the truth, not with rejection, not without compassion. I mean, I always speak of we have to bring the truth with clarity and charity. But I would say pray, reconnect to God, and live and proclaim the truth in every way that you're challenged to, even for many going to work today. You may be faced with decisions that your boss may not be happy, but you've got to stay with the truth. And that's true for me as a bishop and for all of us. Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between. And we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way. So make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.